The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. A good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. A hired man, who is not a shepherd, and whose sheep are not his own, sees a wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away, and the wolf catches and scatters them. This is because he works for pay and has no concern for the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know mine, and mine know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I will lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. These also I must lead, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock, one shepherd. That is why my Father loves me, because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own. I have power to lay it down and power to take it up again. This command I have received from my Father. The Gospel of the Lord. Be perfect, just as your heavenly Father is perfect. Jesus spoke these compelling words to the crowds during his Sermon on the Mount. It is a clarion call to each of us as disciples of Christ to transform our lives to be an image of God's holiness in this world. This is not to suggest that we take on a divine status, but rather that we have a heart desire to seek and live God's will each day of our lives. Today's gospel presents us with a familiar image known as the Good Shepherd. Jesus declares that he is the Good Shepherd who will lay down his life for his sheep in obedience to his Father's will. As disciples, we too are called to emulate Jesus' example of a Good Shepherd in our vocation of life. For example, St. John Vianney, the patron saint of priests, was informed by his bishop that his very first assignment would be in a parish that had little love for God. Father Vianney took the bishop's words to prayer and begged God to use his priesthood for the conversion of that parish, promising that he would give small penances in confessional as he would complete the larger penance himself. God answered his prayer by providing Father Vianney a supernatural gift to see people's hearts, along with the knowledge of past events in their lives, plus the ability to see into their future. God greatly blessed Father Vianney's prayer by increasing his flock from 200 parishioners to over 20,000 pilgrims a year, as he spent 16 to 18 hours a day in the confessional. Here is but one example of how people saw Father Vianney's vocation as a good shepherd. A woman was devastated by her husband committing suicide. She sought Father Vianney's counsel, yet the confession lines were so long that she was ready to give up. When in a moment of mystical insight, Father Vianney looked at her and shouted, He is saved! The woman couldn't believe that was a direct answer to her prayer. So Father Vianney again said, I tell you, he is saved, but in purgatory. You must pray for him. Another compelling example is the life of Raymond Colby, who grew up during the political unrest in occupied Poland. His ardent devotion to our Blessed Mother drove him to ask her intercession that his life might be used to restore the unification of Poland. Our Blessed Mother asked Raymond to pick one of two crowns, one white and one red. He chose both in his desire to be pure and a martyr. At the age of 13, Raymond responded to God's call to become a conventual Franciscan friar. During World War II, Father Maximilian Kolbe was taken to the Auschwitz death camp, where he served as a good shepherd to prisoners, offering the sacraments until that day when he offered his own life in exchange for saving another man who had a family. Truly, our priests are wonderful examples of good shepherds. But the question remains, how can we live as good shepherds in our vocation as family? One vivid example occurred back in 1955 
as my mother was preparing our 6.30 evening dinner, while my brother and I waited at the top of the driveway for our dad's car to arrive just after 6 p.m. This evening was different, however, because the time moved past 7 p.m. and my dad was still missing. Now, at the age of five, I had no idea what being an hour late meant, but I do recall the worried look on my mom's face as we all stood in that driveway, waiting for dad's car to arrive. Finally, just after 9 p.m., my dad pulled into the driveway. And when we saw him open the car door, we took one look and stared in disbelief. My dad's coat was smoke laden with burn marks all over it. His hands were a patchwork of blisters wrapped in gauze. In a frantic voice, my mom said, what happened? And in his response is a story worth retelling even today. He said, after I left the office, I was driving through the city streets when I noticed a small flicker of light under a wooden front porch. I thought the light seemed out of place, so I decided to stop the car to take a closer look. As I approached the wooden lattice mesh under the front porch, I heard a little boy crying, so I asked his name, and he shouted, David. Looking through the lattice, I saw David's pants were engulfed in flames. I searched for an opening on the side of the porch, and then I crawled underneath and wrapped my coat around David's body. It was such a tiny place that I had to drag him out from under the porch while I used my hands to put out the remaining flames that had now burned into his legs. When I finally got the fire out, I ran to the front door to get help, hoping that someone would be home. When no one answered, I thought about driving David to the hospital. When a city bus stopped on the other side of the street and a woman jumped out screaming, what happened to my son? I told her how I found David burning under the porch and she begged me to take her and David to the hospital where he was immediately transferred to a burn unit. They cleaned and wrapped my hands and I stayed with his mother until the doctors assured her that David would survive. Then my dad turned to me and said, David was the same age as you. I just had to save him. In that moment, dinner was the last thing on our minds as we took my dad into the house and cared for his wounds. From that day forward, David's family became close friends with our family, and they invited my dad to visit the following Christmas. Dad invited me to tag along, thinking David and I might enjoy playing together and become friends. When we arrived, I was stunned to see David for the first time. Even though he had recovered from those burns, David's legs looked like a frightful patchwork of skin grass that came from his stomach and his back. I also remember thinking that as horrific as that sight was for me at five years old, I viewed my dad as a hero, pretty much like our gospel talks about that good shepherd for saving David's life and giving that family a joyous Christmas that could never be adequately described in words. David and I remained friends throughout our school years, and I'm delighted to say that during David's high school years, he won numerous athletic awards and received a full college sports scholarship. Whenever someone asked David what drove him to athletic greatness, he would always retell the story about how my dad saved his legs and his life many years earlier. Being the very best athlete, said David, was my way of saying thank you for that precious gift of life. My brothers and sisters at many levels, David's story is a heartfelt example of what it means to be a good shepherd to another. And so today, just as David was overjoyed to tell others about how his legs and life were saved, so too, may we delight in telling others that because of Easter, Jesus, our Messiah, our God, Savior, and Good Shepherd, rescued us from the eternal fires of hell. For this is what we celebrate during this joyous Easter season, to be a Good Shepherd, so that others might see Jesus Christ present in and through our lives.